Nice to be here with you today. Last time I was in uh, Estonia, uh, I was a bit less sober than today. So uh, it's of course very sobering to be uh, in your presence, in the presence of thinkers and scholars in all the adult education. Um, so again, it's an honor and pleasure to be able to share with you the research I've been doing for almost five years, a bit more, on the learning philosophies in, in older age. I have noticed through hearing many presentations to, uh, yesterday that there's more talk about identity, that we need to find some frameworks where identity is actually considered, accepted, and fostered. And I have the solution for you, or one solution for you, <laughs> which is uh, a late modern statement um, or restatement of the principles of educational gerontology, which are also, or which is older adult education, but uh, if you want to say it from a, with fancy words, it would be educational gerontology. Uh, of course, there's a historical aspect to why this is called educational gerontology. It starts in uh, the States, then in Britain and the United Kingdom, and then uh, later through Malta, it, bec it became more popularized. But that's for another uh, talk. Um, so when we say today educational gerontology or critical educational gerontology, please have in mind we're talking about older adult education and critical older adult education. So yes, today I'm gonna tell you that it's time for a late modern rationale for educating, uh, teaching and learning of older people. And I want to tell you that uh, Anthony Giddens social theory is a good framework to um, understand teaching and uh, the, the learning and teaching of older people in today's world. And I would also like to tell you that with that social the uh, so critical social theory, we can also adopt identity-based transformative learning that was restated later by uh, Knud Illeris that took Mesero's transformative learning theory and made it about identity rather than changes in identity rather than changes in cognitive structure. So this is the essence of today. And I hope you enjoy the lectures. I won't be having pictures or videos, so I'm sorry for that. I think you got used to that yesterday, perhaps, but uh, not today. So, um, yes. What are we going to talk about now? Uh, I will just uh, introduce briefly some demographic, demographic imperatives, because, of course, we cannot uh, start a lecture or a presentation about all the adult education without warning you of the dooming demographic shifts and uh, of course, so every article starts with this, so why not start here too. Then I'm gonna introduce some interesting global uh, policy that's taking place around aging, lifelong learning, the intersection of aging and lifelong learning, uh, which sounds like um, an all spice recipe that like but we will see more on that later. Then we will talk about what are the different kinds of lifelong learning that we have today that are being practiced for older people at least, for non-formal, informal, formal. And then we're gonna together trace answers to central educational questions that the learning philosophies in older age, so far the ones we have, have been um, providing us. But also how do we answer these central questions based on empirical uh, papers, based on empirical research, so philosophy and empirical results as well. Because, yeah, the one needs the other. So we will look into this famous or uh, humanist critical debate around central questions in older adult education, and then um, looking into empirical developments as well. And finally, I will draw the contour of a late modern uh, structuration is rationale for educating and teaching um, older people. Why is it needed? What are the central concepts? How do we define central educational concepts via this critical uh, social theory and the identity-based transformative learning? And finally, conclusion I, and way forward where I admit that I have not invented the wheel. I have just gotten a wheel and putting it on a car that was uh, a bit slow and rusty to make it go further. So. Um, and I would, of course, let you know what am I doing as next steps, future. <sighs> Demography, it's said to be the raison d'etre of educational gerontology. I haven't said that. It's Gladning and Battersby in 1990 already. 
said that, when they first stated the uh, critical principles of educational gerontology, we will come back to that later. But without this baby boomers, without this demographic rationale, we would not be having this craze now about all the adult learning and why do we need to teach um, and educate all the people for whatever reasons. I forgot what was it. Okay, now I'm supposed to show you numbers about uh, how into, uh, uh, is it back? No, it's not. Well, I can tell you, I remember that, that already uh, right now we have um, more people that are aged 60 plus than people who are aged less than five years old. So that's important. In 2050, we will have two thirds of um, older populations living in uh, middle and in low and middle income countries. Um, <clears throat> In 2050 also, we will have 2.1 billion older people, 65 plus living in, um, around us. Also in 2050, 32%, if I'm correct, of the uh, EU population will be also older people. So Europe is aging, everyone is aging, including you. <laughs> so yes, as we said, I have managed to remember some of those. But China, for example, will be having uh, in the <clears throat> already, sorry, China already has the largest population of 65 plus individuals, 166 million Chinese, older Chinese at 11.9% of this population. But China doesn't have the biggest share of older people in its population. It's actually Japan, which stands at 28.2%. And after Japan, we have Italy, Finland, Portugal, Greece, following in that order in percentage share of older people and their population. So considering retirement policies and aging populations, we have to think also about who is going to drive the wheels of welfare, who's going to keep the economies churning. You know, my astrology said that uh, <laughs> Thursday, Thursday wasn't going to be a good day. <laughs> so, on behalf of Gemini and the stars, I apologize. Yes, sure. We have to organize an Ezra event without technology. <laughs> Just to talk. Hmm? Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, it, it jammed. <laughs> so, in order to keep people Older people engaged in, uh, you know, make sure that they are back in the system, they do not retire. There's something called employability. We need to make sure that they remain employable by companies. And this employability is defined by the ability to remain employable in the labor market. So by having necessary skills, attitudes, etc., etc., to be able to remain employable. This employability, of course, um, uh, sup supposedly implies that, that there is a cooperation between the employees and the employers in maintaining this employability in older age. But in real life, as we know, most concepts get broken by reality. But in real, in, in, in real term or, or in practices, this employability is meaning that more responsibilizing on the employees or the older workers and less is being done from the perspective of the employers because, of course, they think that it's not a, a smart economic investment to retrain uh, older workers who, by the way, older workers from an organizational perspective are those who are 45 and older. We're not talking only about 65 plus now. So there's a lot of discrimination, a lot of ageism at the workplace. They like demography here. Let's see, is it? Okay, perfect. 
So yes. So there's this so-called uh, psychological contract between employers and employees that you have to remain employable. So I, you have to acquire skills. At the same time, the employer has to provide training for you. But of course, as we said, this is not happening very well. For example, OECD figures show that 24% of the OECD older people are getting, uh, or not older people, but 55 to 66, they're getting formal job-related training, only 24%. Their employability is, of course, at risk, and because of confounding factors of health, well-being, stereotypes and ageism at the workplace, lower educational attainment is decisive in, for example, Czech Republic, uh, Latvia and Lithuania, that if you, are older, if you are an older worker with a lower educational attainment, there's very low chance, chances of you being hired in older age or later on. In Japan, for example, the Japanese Society of Gerontology and Geriatrics proposed the age, so we can call you an older Japanese, to 75. This is insane if you think about it. But that's because they have uh, a large share of uh, older people in their population. In Singapore, for example, also a South uh, Eastern Asian country that is aging at, uh, rapidly, they have developed, they started developing programs. For example, their national program is called um, uh, Skills Future Singapore, and it targets 40 plus individuals with everybody gets uh, a credit, some sort of a money uh, coupon, if you want to call it like that. And then they sign up for uh, retraining opportunities, reskilling. And these are being given by different levels of educational institutions, vocational, higher education, etc. And they also, the government gives incentives for employers in Singapore to retain older workers and to retrain them. So there is, there is increasing awareness, at least at the policy level, that we need to do that. In Canada also, they have, um, they have targeted initiatives for older workers, TIAO, and it's, it, um, it stayed or it lasted from 2006 to 2017. Uh, and this was also a national policy uh, program developed with the different provinces they have and different stakeholders. Also advertising or promoting the retraining of older people. One program that is still running is called Older Workers Program at Yukon University. And it's a 13 weeks program that targets specifically vulnerable older workers. So, the good thing about these programs is that they really, or supposedly, they target people who are in need. But what kind of policy do we have right now around aging, health, economy, and lifelong learning? Because we all know that these are very, very interconnected. The Madrid International Plan of Action in 2002 highlighted that we need to provide opportunities and programs to support older people's engagement in society towards their self-fulfillment and well-being. Learning is, of course, one of this. The silver economy is a term that the European Commission uh, adopted and started learning and it is uh, started using. And it is the sum of all the economic activity, if we think about it from a GDP perspective, what kind of economy is being driven by older people in terms of consumption of goods and services and people that are employed at the service of older people. This number is significant, 4.2 trillion euros in GDP in the EU was sustained, um, was that number, what was that silver economy in 2015. 78 million jobs in EU had to do with this silver economy. So this is huge. WHO has recently, uh, not recently, but like three years ago maybe, started this decade of healthy aging where they capitalize on older people's agency and suggest very different areas of action. They want to change how we think and feel about aging and, and uh, age and aging and older people. And they want to ensure that communities foster the abilities of older people. It underscores a specific role for lifelong learning to enable older people to retain and remain individual agents who want to maintain identity, they want to, they want to be autonomous, and they want to preserve, preserve a sense of purpose even in their older age. The goal here is self-actualization, and that word is important to keep in mind, self-actualization. <laughs> yes.
Yes, more policy. Of course, we have the sustainable development goal, goal number four, which tries to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all, and obviously older people counted in. More recently, if you heard about the Confintea, which obviously you probably did, the Adult Education Conference in Marrakesh, they uh, ended with a, the Marrakesh framework that states that uh, adult education and learning gives youth and adults an understanding of the issue. Here they're talking about climate change. But we see that adult education and learning can play an important role in empowering adult and older citizens so that they become role models for children, change agents at local, national, and global levels. So again, agency, change are, are key words that we, we are seeing more and more in global policy. WHO's project on uh, age-friendly cities pushes for less constraining environments. Obviously, when we talk about cities, we're talking about age-friendly roads, age-friendly buildings, etc., etc. To the point where, in 2010, we started having a concept called age-friendly universities, which is a spin-off from this WHO project on age-friendly cities. And now it became a global network of 40 universities uh, now we'll talk about this age-friendly universities uh, soon in later slides. UNESCO has been focusing a lot lately also on the contributions of higher education to the lifelong learning in general, but specifically to older people. So that's also a, a sign that global policy is really shifting towards uh, educating older people. Again, there's a great emphasis on the agency of older people. So where are we when it comes to lifelong learning for older people? To my knowledge, we have three generations of lifelong learning. The first generation was, as everyone knows it, came with the Foray report in um, 1972. And this is a very famous report uh, that Foray did for UNESCO. And everyone thinks or knows that uh, the first generation is a purely humanistic um, rationale for lifelong learning for older people, uh, older people included, but it, not necessarily older people, everyone. However, recently, we started thinking with Heike, uh, Silvenoin and Kinnari, they published a paper wondering, was this really first generation? Was it really humanistic? And they show how there was elements of um, capital, talking about human capital already in the Foray report. So they tell us that perhaps this first generation wasn't really humanistic or purely humanistic. The second generation of lifelong learning, of course, came with more adoption by the EU and in, in, uh, in policies focusing on lifelong learning uh, as central concept in shaping Europe's knowledge-based society. Lifelong learning in these policy documents, research articles, academic debates, has become a tool for economic competitiveness in the face of globalization, and uh, we have <coughs> Alexandra Widnall here. We're gonna be citing you a little bit today, so. But this, ge this generation is uh, reproached for being very economic, brutally economic, only cares about the economy. So we have now a third generation that is more based on citizenship, and we can call it soft economic um, rationale. It mixes democracy, citizenship, economic development also. Lifelong learning is a multidimensional strategy nowadays to promote employability, citizenship, social cohesion, personal and professional fulfillment, and adaptability to a changing world. That is why with NOLS, concept of long life learning may already be categorized under this generation. Perhaps she doesn't agree, but we would like to hear what she thinks. Alexandra Widnall, early on in 2010, she thought, okay, we have those grand narratives about educating older people, but she is more interested in a policy concept. She called it long life learning instead of lifelong learning because she did empirical work, especially in her book in 2010. She found that learning is essentially individual, highly interpretive. Older people's willingness and abilities to learn are often ambiguously affected by previous learning experiences. It doesn't mean that if you had a bad learning experience in your early age, that then you will be hating education or learning later on. It's much more complex than that. And we have to thank Laura today. Where is Laura? You have ruined the word complex for me. So now I have to think very well. <laughs> 
when I'm using the word complex. Education enhances personal development according to this long life learning concept, but also touches upon social justice. It doesn't need to be either or. It simultaneously benefits older people and societies and considers the ever-changing environments in postmodernity. That is why Withnall's concept can be categorized under a postmodern rationale for lifelong learning. But we also know that um, long life learning is a concept that is still needed today more than ever. Across these different generations, the three generations, we have varying responsibilities that are attributed to the individual or to societies. So it's either for individual benefits or for uh, social change or for societal impact, etc. But what we learned so far from years and years of lifelong learning is that it is very unreasonable to think about a purely humanistic goal or a purely functional goal to lifelong learning or a purely intrinsic or purely extrinsic. This is not the time for, oh Lord, this is not the time for polarizations, for dichotomies, because again, older age is a very complex construct. Moving now to talking about non-formal lifelong learning. We all know that there are many institutions that offer non-formal learning opportunities for older people. These are called universities for the third age, universities for seniors, OSHERs, lifelong learning institutes, learning and retirement institutes, open universities in Spain, if I'm correct, Université du Troisième Age in France, or Université pour tous. We can call it so many things under different nomenclatures, but they offer mostly liberal arts education. It's uh, uh, philosophy, it's arts, it's literature, very, very liberal arts education. Nobody from these institutions wants to promote social change in the sense that go to the streets and uh, demonstrate and that kind of radical um, change, which we will see later on. So these U3As, as we say, they are everywhere. It's be, it became a global phenomenon. They, for some reason, which of course, interesting to study, they offer the same uh, palette of curricula, as we said. They attract middle class older people, usually from uh, ethnic or usually lacking uh, ethnic minorities, mostly feminized, as in like mostly um, Older women are attracted by these, um, by these uh, universities. Okay, uh, maybe, can we skip this and I can just talk? Do you mind? If, yeah, perfect. I, I will really start believing in astrology now. <laughs> Who's a Gemini here? <laughs> no? Uh, do you have a bad day today? Eh? <laughs> no? Okay. So as we said, they have these universities for third age have been reproached also by the very known Marvin Formosa uh, because of their elitism and because of the lack of... Um, heterogeneity when it comes to social class. So he has really, really been attacking universities for a third age from that class perspective. He also reproached them for not inviting older people to question the, their social realities, to question um, self-question and question societies around them and their social positions uh, in their life worlds. So that has been um, a very important remark that Formosa kept um, highlighting when it comes to universities for third age. And he warns us that if they don't reform and if they don't live up to that challenge of helping older people question their uh, societies and entourage and themselves as well, that they might become obsolete eventually. Alongside universities for third age, we have also, since these are mostly feminized, we have um, men's sheds and those are the, men's sheds as we hear it, 
they consist of a group of men getting together and doing the same things that are being done in universities for the third age. But this is more of a horizontal, um, less academic environment. And you have men doing woodworking and things that men would like to do. Uh, I'm not so fond of this gender, uh, you know, saying that this is a man thing, this is a woman thing, but it's happening like that. Uh, and I think that's so far when it comes to uh, universities for the third age. Moving on to um, form, uh, mo uh, moving on to formal lifelong learning opportunities for older people. And these, of course, uh, are done at formal institutions and they usually lead to vocational uh, degrees. So at the end of these uh, opportunities, older people will get a degree. They can work with it, they can just put it in their drawer, but it's, it's a qualifying degree. Going back to age-friendly universities, it's a concept that started in Ireland, in Dublin City University, and it stands on 10 principles. Some of them, if I remember correctly, intergenerational solidarity, developing age-friendly physical uh, spaces at universities, promoting lifelong learning opportunities at universities, whether formal or non-formal, uh, also preparing older people to have encore careers, delay their retirement in case they would like that. Uh, that falls under the university's uh, three-layered uh, mission of research, uh, service, um, research education, and community service. This uh, network that started with Dublin City University in Ireland also has um, partners that were also at the beginning in Arizona State University, for example, in the States. And now, as I said, it became a global network of 40 universities around the world. Um, yes, moving now to informal learning. So we have non-formal, we talked about it, formal, and now informal. And informal learning, of course, can happen under many uh, circumstances. It can be you looking on YouTube and learning something haphazardly. It can be also in social movement learning, which is a very, very important uh, educational endeavor for older people. We have seen people gathering together. Do you think this time <coughs> will work? <sighs> Informal lifelong learning. <laughs> so we have seen people gather together because they have a cause. And for example, we can take the uh, raging grannies in Canada, a bunch of older women getting together fighting uh, for environmental justice, fighting for uh, older people's rights. It, it's not necessarily something that has to do with older age, but it can also extend to political activism on all and very different spheres. But they are not politically affiliated though, but they are very politically active. There are many studies that show that raging grannies effect on older women who use their identities to make fun of some, you know when they say about claiming back an identity that is usually made fun of. So that's what they do. They, they call themselves grannies. They go down to the streets dressed in granny style with knitting and they sing songs, etc., etc. So the effect of this on them is usually self-actualization, well-being, identity formation, community feeling, but also social change. These people are on the ground. They are, they are leading social change. Unlike, for example, non-formal U3A people who like to go sit in classrooms and just benefit individually, which is not wrong at all, but I'm just highlighting the difference. We have also more recently the Nanas in, uh, in Australia, which is also um, a phenomenon called Nanagogy, which is learning by being a Nana. And it also follows more or less the same kind of um, concept of raging grannies. They also are involved with environmental issues, social justice issues, climate uh, issues. They do craftivism. That's how um, the author, I think I forgot her name, but White House. No, Larry, Larry White House, I think. She wrote about uh, this in her thesis. They do, the, um, she writes in her paper, act, the, um, they benefit from active citizenship, justice advocacy, Confidence in public speaking, craftivism, critical reflection, knowledge of legal rights, and negotiating with authorities. If this is not emancipation or social empowerment, I don't know what, what would be 
emancipation. So that's uh, important to keep in mind. Ah, formal learning. I have forgot to, to say something about um, this formal lifelong learning, is that when we bring older people to classrooms and universities that are made for younger people, there is a risk there. We can't just like mainstream them. Hey, you guys, come on. It's not like, I'm sorry for the comparison, but it's not like having a dog-friendly shop. You leave uh, some water uh, in front of the door and you call yourself an age-friendly uh, pet store. And no, it's not like that at all. You're bringing older people to universities. The physical and social environment has to be accommodating for them. Otherwise, this is a huge mistake. It's going to be the same, reproducing inequalities that older people are facing in society. So I know that the age-friendly university concept is working hard, especially in Dublin City University, towards that. But it's still, it's still a long way from mainstreaming in a critical way, if we can say that, older people in, in classrooms. Now we're getting to the juicy part. So all these practices are happening among us. We have policies, we have practices. But what kind of philosophical backing do we have to these practices? And that's <laughs> very, very important aspect. We cannot just have practices without really pondering these central educational questions that I'm going to talk about. These central educational questions in older adult education, I did not invent them. They are the usual questions that are being asked in adult education theories or philosophies. What is the purpose of education? What is the difference between learners? What, how do we perceive the difference? What is the role of older learners in the classroom? What are the barriers they face? What is the role of the teacher in the classroom? <laughs> and what benefits do they experience? How do, you, how do we conceptualize those benefits? And what content should be taught? And this is also another important question. And finally, what is the, ver the world view in analyzing human needs? What is the overarching theory or like sociological perspective that frames uh, all the adult learning? I had a very nice figure here, but you're not going to be able to see it. <sighs> Can we just try to show this picture? Because it's important to um, grasp. But um, you've all known. Um, <laughs> so we have different perspectives of learning in older age. There are many, but there are, of course, dominant learning philosophies in older age. And if you have read Dominique, Dominique Kahn's paper about the different epistemologies in older adult learning, we, you would know that we have nine different models in different cultures and contexts. But what I'm going to focus on today is the Anglo-Saxon model which is the educational gerontology spanning from David Patterson in the 1976 in the States, and then how it moved to the, to the UK with David Battersby, Frank Lenning, uh, Keith Percy, Alexandra Woodnall to some extent also, and Marvin Formosa. We're going to take Marvin Formosa's work, the third restatement of these principles or of this learning philosophy, and restate Formosa's philosophy. And the difference between all these statements and restatements, which are in fact three, two in 1990, now it's getting, aha, there it is. So that is why it was important to show this, this picture. So on the spectrum of collective social framework for uh, this learning philosophy to individual, we see that we have David Battersby, Frank Glenning, Battersby from Australia, Glenning from the UK, Marvin Formosa, Brian Finson on the collective social side. And on this side, we have a bit more, so a bit less individualistic perhaps than Keith Percy, but we have Alexandra Woodnall's also postmodern take on long life uh, learning that I just talked about. So Keith Percy has a humanist perspective. Alexandra Woodnall had a postmodern long life uh, policy oriented framework. Marvin Formosa did the third restatement, and we're going to talk about that today and restate Marvin Formosa's restatement. Finson, Frank Lenning, David Battersby were pretty much on the same side, which is a very radical uh, end or goal to all the adult education. Ephraian, Gramscian-inspired 
radical take on older adult education. If you can see on both sides, we have had a debate. These people have actually engaged with each other in writing. They have responded to each other's statements by saying, Percy said this, but this is that. Glenning did this, but I believe this. So we will talk about that today. Why it is important to do this? Why do we need this examination? Why do we need to look into these old documents that have been there sitting since the 90s? Because of course we're interested in philosophically based um, practices and policies, right? We don't wanna be just haphazardly doing stuff. So it's timely because, thank you. Dominique Kahn tells us that researchers in adult education need to have the, opp the opportunity and possibility to test whatever we talk about in philosophical matters in, in, in different models. There is, of course, a persisting need for theoretical developments that Alexandra Woodnall also very recently reminded us of in social and educational gerontology in general. That's also because philosophies of learning usually respond to certain practical challenges in life, like now we're freaking out, we need to educate all the people and retrain them and reskill them. Here's the philosophy of learning that will help us do that. So we respond to current challenges. We have had impressive theoretical and empirical developments that have marked the last 30 years in educational gerontology. Impressive changes. And the philosophies of learning have not kept in touch with these empirical changes. So we need to update them. Concepts in educational gerontologies, which are educational goals, uh, first and foremost, such as self-fulfillment, emancipation, empowerment, remain unclearly defined. We don't know what do you mean by empowerment in this paper, what do you mean by empowerment in this other paper, emancipation the same. There are different types of emancipation, different types of empowerment. What do we mean by self-fulfillment? Ambiguities also remain around the role of Freire and pedagogy in framing all the adult education. Do we need, can we have a radical uh, Freirean based uh, education that he in the 70s applied on peasants and that's his word, not mine. Can, can, can it still apply to older people? Were the peasants in Brazil in the same mental situation that older people today are in? Uh, that's a question. The debate between the humanist and the, so, and the critical perspectives on, on educating older people are very polarized. So one would tell you the goal of learning in older age is self-actualization. Formosa comes and says, absolutely not. It is social empowerment. It is social change. It is emancipation. Otherwise, it's pedagogical treachery in his and Freire's uh, words. So as you see, we have this X, not Y debate, very polarizing very dichotomous um, discussion between these two learning philosophies. Older adults attending liberal, we have empirical evidence. Some of it is by me and by other people who have worked on this. We, we know that liberal arts education that is on the other side of radical education, radical Freire education, can still be empowering, but not according to Formosa and um, the critical camp. They don't believe that uh, liberal arts education can be socially empowering. So, but in fact, it is. And I have written a paper with, Mar uh, with Maninen, uh, Yuri Maninen, and that was based on our meeting in Italy in 2019, where he talked about the Bell Project. And then we talked together and we wrote a paper focusing on the outcomes of uh, these older, pe or older people studying in 10 different European countries. And we found that the more vulnerable individuals are, so in terms of age, gender, they acquire more benefits when they learn in, in, um, in these 10 different countries. So yes, liberal arts education, if you study philosophy, if you study whatever, is empowering. You get self-efficacy, confidence, you're out there. But on the other side, Freirean older adult education that is supposedly emancipating have obviously failed to do that in many occasions. And we're gonna talk about that, how and why. In these studies, we always notice that the researcher tells us at the end of the conclusion that we did this intervention, a la Freire, 
And then we have noticed that, yes, they might have risen in critical reflection, but when it came to critical action, which is both are needed for Freire, it did not happen. They have not mobilized any sort of radical action. We will see what's the problem with that later. But Kern also tells us that it is indispensable that we talk about something in common in reference to the need for a shared paradigm. As we said, we have nine different models of all the other education. And Kern tells us we need a shared paradigm. So if I'm talking to Laura or to Magnus or whoever about all the other education, we need to be on the same page when we talk about concepts, etc., etc. So that's missing right now. So I. Another important table. Like. <laughs> very, very uh, timely. So. Okay, along the lines of these, this debate between critical and humanist philosophies of learning, there's an obvious divide along the lines of agency, focus on agency and social, uh, and uh, the focus on social structures. And, ah, oh, perfect. That's the table that summarizes, you can see the picture of everybody involved. And how do they, <laughs> yes, please. That's, this is very important. So, Philosophies of learning usually are dealing with this academic worldview. It's usually critical social theory when it comes to critical educational gerontology. Marxism was mobilized in 1990 with Paulo Freire. Formosa thought that Marxism was out of fashion. So in 2011, it's back. It's back. So Formosa decided to restate the first principles changing Marxism with Bourdieu, um, Bourdieu's theories, social theories, but keeping Paulo Freire. Okay. So, try to hang, hang on with me right now, because it might get a bit confusing. All the learners, according to the critical perspective, they are oppressed, naive, complacent, and they need to be emancipated. They need to be saved from this ideological confusion that they live in. That was the 1990s perspective. Formosa, in 2011, kept this perspective when he restated the statements. So yes, all the people are still oppressed, they're naive, and they need a savior teacher that comes and uh, enlighten them, increases their critical reflection, and using Freire's, of course, famous word, conscientization. So that is the critical perspective. But on, on the humanist side, we have Keith Percy sitting and saying, what? No, no, this is, this is way too much, you guys. Teachers should not have this social empowering role. The police, the social worker, perhaps, have that role, but not the teacher. And what? OK. OK. I don't know what happened there, but <laughs> yeah. <sighs> anyway, besides older learners and their profile, the um, nature of uh, motivation that older people have was also polarized. So the humanist thinks that older people have this innate, intrinsic need to learn that everybody has, regardless. The, uh, the, the critical perspective, they think that this need to learn, the motive to learn, is based on, uh, you know, a social class Bourdieuian perspective that is a non-conscious class struggle. So you go and sign yourself up in a university for a third age as an expression of this non-conscious class struggle that you're not aware of. So this motivation is defined by a reason that you're not aware of, which I think is, is pretty problematic. But Another obvious difference between, what happened here, by the way? Oh, okay, we do this, we do this, yeah, oh, perfectly. Okay, 
Can you see this again? Yeah. yeah, so this summarizes a lot and that way I can skip some slides. So as we see, older learners are powerless, complacent, oppressed and naive when it comes to the critical perspective. For the humanist, well, they have more leisure time and fewer responsibilities. Why not? They learn because they have this intrinsic need to learn. For most, I restated again saying in 2011, they are oppressed and possess differential levels of power differently from the Marxism, which has a zero sum power. You're either oppressed or empowered. With Formosa, the power became more nuanced and uh, when it comes to capital also. So the motives for learning, class struggles and false consciousness, natural intrinsic needs for the humanists, class struggle and habitus when it comes to Formosa's statement, Educational goal, empowerment and emancipation, self-actualization for the humanist, empowerment and emancipation for uh, Formosa. And please keep in mind that one is canceling the other here. So when we put them in different colors, it means Formosa rejects Percy and Percy rejects the, um, the first critical statement. The teacher's role is a liberator, Freyrian liberator, leader or he's a facilitator orchestrator that doesn't need to emancipate learners. But with Formosa, again, it is an educator leader. The focus here is an obvious divide between agency and structure. Who wants to focus on agency, but who wants to focus on social structure? And the problem is that whoever focused on agency thought that agency happens in a social vacuum, but that's not correct or possible. Whoever have, uh, focused on structures have obviously not left any space for the agency of older people. So in a way, look at this, look at this sentence. Formosa referring to Bourdieu uh, when it comes to motivation. The practical world that is constituted in the relationship with the habitus acting as a system of cognitive and motivating structures is a world of already realized ends. Whatever you do is already realized, is already predetermined. Also, in, in one of his papers, Formosa compares learning at the U3A as displaying books on your sofa table as a, some sort of a social, it's very performative. It's very like, look, look what I'm doing. So I have done many empirical studies trying to place all the other teaching and learning in a structurationist perspective that tells us, you guys, we do action, we have agency, we do it in a structural milieu we are contributing to this structure by reproducing this agency, this action. So action happens, or the outcome of action is structure, but it's also happening in a structural setting. So you cannot separate agency from structures. They are one, not two. Giddens, Anthony Giddens takes this dichotomic view of agency and structure and calls it, puts it in a du duality. So. Whatever I'm doing now is presenting to you, I'm reinforcing the structure of, that is used by a speaker standing behind this and talking. But I'm also, if I stop doing this, the structure would not hold. If all of us stop lecturing in this way, the structure would disappear. So there's no structure outside action. That's at least what Giddens tells us. In one of my studies, I have asked myself, are they really naive, complacent, and oppressed, these older learners? I have done, uh, conducted study, studies at a university for a third age, and I asked them, how do, you, how do you explain to us your social realities? Do you understand your social reality? And I, I went there thinking, having Formosa in my head, that these people are gonna be oppressed, naive, they'll be like uh, ideologically confused, but I was completely surprised. They were able to talk about elitism in their own institution, the University for Third Age. They talked about gender issues. They talked about ageism. They understand what ageism is. They have experienced it. They have even tried to fight it in many ways. They mobilized resources to fight it. So that, in many ways, challenges this idea of people need this leader to engage in social change. But we will see about that more later. Now I'm going to speed up, so I'm sorry for that because the Time is running up and I need some leniency perhaps, maybe five or 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here, we are here for you. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. So I started looking in empirical studies 
because I did empirical studies also beyond, in addition to examining the philosophies of learning, I wanted to see these philosophies of learning, can they stand in reality? Do they have empirical basis? So I also realized that when it comes to empirical studies, there's also a divide between agency and structure when it comes to these central educational questions. If we look at motivation, we see that some studies tell you that people are just interested in this and they go for it. People just want to make friends, older people, and they go for it. They go learn at universities for a third age. Um, it's socialization, intellectual stimulation, um, events, etc. You name it. There's so many studies of those. When it comes to a structural perspective on why do people learn, you get Formosa, you get Bourdieuian perspective, you get social class. That they are not aware what they're doing, they are just acting in the social class uh, struggle, and they go sign up for this uh, university for third age to learn, to study. I am all for this social class perspective, but it cannot be reduced to that. We, according to Giddens, we cannot reduce the reasons for action to something that is non-conscious to the actors themselves. So yes, we analyze the social structural perspective, but only in relation to the action that is taking place. So when it comes to a duality of structure, as we said, agency and structure are one. We have to think, so sorry, in my, in my study about this motivation and applying the structurationist perspective on motivating uh, the motivation for learning in older age, I have found that older people can be reflexive. They are reflexive, they are rational when they take the decision to study in older age. And that is because a triggering event usually happens. Like Laura, I think, also talked about it in her presentation. A triggering event happens. Divorce, death of uh, a loved one, retirement, uh, finding yourself alone. There are so many things that are, in a way, identity defying, an identity defining, and they make you question who you are in that particular moment. You lose some sort of what Giddens calls ontological security. You're like, I'm used to do things in a certain way, and now I'm not, I can't. So you go, you take yourself, you sign up in a, in a university for a third age. But to do that, of course, you need to mobilize economic capital, cultural capital, etc. But to say, that there's no reflexivity happening on the part of older uh, actors joining universities for seniors is, is an exaggeration. So what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to say is that in this paper, I argue that both, we need to examine the motivation for learning from uh, agency, from the duality of structure perspective, that is the action itself, but also the non-intended consequences that happen that is the, cla the, the class struggle. That is the exclusion of some older learners who are, have less education, are more vulnerable, and cannot <coughs> join these universities for seniors. When it comes to barriers to learning in older age, I have also applied a structurationist perspective because, again, the studies we have that use crosses typology of barriers, um, dispositional, situational, contextual, they are also separated on agency and structure opposites. But Formosa and I have written that paper together. And in that one, we argue that we cannot separate this barrier, understanding barriers on an agency and structure levels. They need to be integrated together again. Because I'll just give you a quick example. One older learner was taking her car to the university for seniors. And she was always late. She couldn't find a parking spot. Now, if I tell you that, you will tell me this is an individual problem. She's driving her car. She could take any other way of transportation. But upon arriving late, she enters late to the classroom. She knocks the door. She comes in. She interrupts the teacher. She disturbs her classmates. She has to tell the teacher why she was late and apologizes and sit in. The, te the, the participants in the study reported that they are disturbed by this and that the teacher sometimes loses focus and it becomes a classroom problem, becomes an institutional problem in a way. When this happens, the teacher reports the, the issue to the administrator. An administrator would send an email to that learner saying that, can you please not come uh, late anymore because you're disturbing the classroom and the class protocol that is an institutional protocol for how to behave in the classroom. So again, becoming an institutional problem. So having that in mind, the learner, whenever she's late, she stops coming to the classroom. She just ditches the class and not shows up anymore. So, 
What I'm trying to say here is that a problem that starts at the individual level can easily become an institutional problem. And that is why we need to understand these interactions or the barriers through interactions that happen between institutional agents, teachers, learners, and administrators. Because in many cases, they are the products of non-intentional, um, uh, sorry, unintended consequences. So I do something, but the consequence escapes my intention. So that's important also. The goals and outcomes, and this is even more juicy here. As we said before, liberal arts education should not, are not supposed to empower uh, older learners. They, and for Formosa, they cannot even empower older learners. But they do, and we talked about that. When it comes to Freyrin-based courses, they should lead older learners on the Freyrin practice of conscientization, critical reflection, and action. But they don't. We have seen partial results. Nai, Formosa many times, and Brown. There's a danger of attributing the teacher to themselves, this savior complex, when it comes to applying Freyrian uh, pedagogy in the classroom. The content has always to be, is always focused on the learner's realities. I will explain that uh, later. I will, I will skip this one and move to a very... So this teacher's role, as we said, is divided among facilitator, orchestrator, or leader, educator, savior, let's say. Let's say that way. When it comes to the leader educator, I want to focus on that. How can a leader educator living in, a, in the same system, in the same world order that we live in today, how can you come and save someone from that world order? What, do you take them to Mars? Do you emancipate them by moving them to Pluto? No. You, th there's no escape from these structures. We move from one systemic structure to the other. So it's not possible to really emancipate, especially when you yourself as a teacher need emancipation. It does not make sense. And here's why. In many of these studies that Formosa has done, many of them actually, there is a tautology. And I will explain how that works. These interventions start with this unequal relationship where teachers are critical and learners are not because they're oppressed, naive, complacent. Then we give them that uh, CEG, critical educational gerontology intervention, hmm? Freyrian intervention. And then after that, the teacher who's the scholar or researcher writing that paper tells us, older learners have become more critically reflective perhaps, but they have missed the call for action. According to Freire, any, um, such case is called verbatim. When you do, uh, when you talk, talk, and don't walk the walk, it's verbatim. When you walk the walk without talking, it's activism. So both of them have to be together, and this is not the case here. So what do, what do these researchers conclude when they fail to take the learners to action? They say, the researcher explains this with the learners' oppression, naivete, and ideological confusion. We are back to scratch. We are back to point zero, whereas teachers are critical and learners remain naive. Because if they were not naive, they, could, they, were, they would be able to understand ageism, they would be able to uh, understand how they internalize this so-called so ageism, uh, how they internalize it. So what I'm saying here is that this unequal relationship between the teacher savior and the older learner is sustained, and there's a promise in the future that this emancipation might take place in the future, but it's very, very hard. It is naive to expect older learners to continue engaging in critical consciousness without any leadership whatsoever in the future lives. So as Formosa here tells us, that emancipatory goal is sometime in the future. We're not sure it's gonna happen, but until then, teachers are more intelligent, more critical, learners are less intelligent, less critical. This is a tautology a cycle that keeps happening, there's no escape of it. What I'm trying to argue here, and that statement I have written in, was just released in the last issue of International Journal of Aging and Education. I have restated Formosa's principles into a late modern restatement where I argue, luckily we can see the table, no jinxing. I'm changing the critical social theory or giving an alternative, not changing, of course, that is based on Anthony Giddens, an identity-based transformative learning that is rewritten by Knud Illeris. This will help us understand uh, identity in older age and how education 
and learning of older people can enhance this identity, can help them become more in line with who they are, who they want to be, in light of who they were before. Older learners are heterogeneous and have complex identities, an unprecedented level of agency, that is true. Of course, social inequalities are still there, but older people have an unprecedented level of agency, we all know that. Motives for learning is both, reflexively and could be due to habit. So we cannot exclude one on the expense of the other. There's reflexivity, there's habitus, there's habit. So we have to analyze both in examining these. The educational goal is, why do I have to choose between self-actualization and emancipation? Theoretically, conceptually, these concepts are very close. Harry Moody in the 80s already used those two concepts together as a goal for education. So self-actualization and consciousness or consciousness raising, is, they are almost the same or very close. So why do we treat them in this polarized way? There's no point. Anthony Giddens gives us this concept of life politics, which is negotiating who you are in today's world, occupying new places, negotiating positions, especially when it comes to entering uh, universities, uh, remaining in the job market beyond retirement, you, we have to negotiate our position, uh, not we, I mean, all the people have to negotiate their positions. And that life politics is a concept that is, can be reinforced uh, by education, helping all the people do understand their identities and make choices based on these identities and on this self question and question their society around them. Teacher's role, I can think of it as a non-coercive and reflexive facilitator of knowledge. We need reflexivity for teachers. I can't just come in in a classroom and just do whatever I do without thinking about my social positions vis-a-vis -vis older learners. Who, who, who am I in relation to them? I'm younger, different generations, same social class. What about uh, sexual orientation? What about this? What about that? A teacher needs to be reflexive not to fall in the trap of becoming a savior. Of course, for the sake of objectivity, and I will finish soon, it's important to acknowledge that there are dangers when it comes to adopting an identity-based rationale for learning. It's very important, especially in today's context. We have seen that global policy for lifelong learning is moving towards more agency for, lifelong, uh, for older people, and that lifelong learning should reinforce this agency by delaying their... Uh, employment, uh, and enhancing their contributions, economic, social, to societies. But for example, McLean and Newlander, uh, they both predict that more and more the rationales for lifelong learning are going to become more vocational, especially concerning older people. There's also the risk that Biesta reminds us of, that what can be said as a right for older people to learn might become a duty, and that is very important we can see traces of that in, in Giddens' uh, third way politics. Reinforcement of lifelong learning skill-based discourses in the coming decades, part of which Giddens also does that. If they, if they were implemented in a wrong way, which is balancing responsibilities and duties for older people, if we just give them duties and no rights, that is a failed recipe. They need to be responsabilized, but at the same time, they need to have rights. A reflexive epistemology in lifelong learning is dangerous because it leaves space to the expression of identities so much that there's a risk of fundamentalism, there's a risk of neo-tribalism, and self-righteous and narcissistic intolerance of difference. I know these are very harsh words, but this is very possible. In a reflexive um, epistemology of knowledge, there's a risk always to pick cherry pick, what kind of knowledge is relevant to me, what knowledge I would believe based on my identity. Very, very crucial danger points. I'm ending right now. I am very interested in this imbalance between intelligent teachers and naive learners, and I want to overcome it. So I have read a lot the work of Jacques Rancière in his book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster. In, this, his, in his philosophy, he tells us very briefly that a teacher doesn't need to know what they're teaching. So a teacher 
needs to mobilize the motivation of learners. That is what teaching is all about, but not to deposit knowledge in people, not to reread the textbook for older people or people in general, because the textbook already has the information. The same intelligence that wrote a textbook is the same intelligence that I as a teacher use, that learners also use. So why do we need to conceive of different intelligences? He thinks, even though empirically it's hard to prove that we are all equally intelligent, he philosophically tells us, what if we assume we are all equally intelligent? So I'm working on that right now. I have a study group with older learners at a university for seniors. I'm trying to teach them about the poetry of mysticism of Gibran, Khalil Gibran. He's a Lebanese American poet who wrote The Prophet. So I'm trying to teach them about mysticism and poetry, which I am clueless about. And I will write an autoethnography about that when I'm done to report, is this really possible in real life? I will end with what this prophet said on teaching. No man can reveal to you aught but that which already lies half asleep in the dawning of your knowledge. The teacher who walks in the shadow of the temple among his followers gives not of his wisdom, but rather of his faith and his lovingness. If he is or she indeed wise, he does not bid you enter the house of his wisdom, but rather leads you to the threshold of your own mind. The astronomer may speak to you of his understanding of space, but he cannot give you his understanding. The musician may sing to you of the rhythm which is in all space, but he cannot give you the ear which arrests the rhythm nor the voice that echoes it. And he who is versed in the science of numbers can tell of the regions of weight and measure, but he or she cannot conduct you there. For the vision of one man lends not its wings to another man. And even as each one of us stands alone in God's knowledge, so, much, so must each one of you be alone in, in his or her knowledge of God and in his understanding of the earth, be it God, be it any kind of knowledge other than God. Thank you so much. But before ending, I, had, I have the honor to present Frank Lending Memorial Lecture in December 5, and I will be talking more about this statement that I didn't have enough time to talk about today. I will go deep in the philosophies of learning. I will talk about what kind of polarization happened in those on December 5. If you're interested, it's going to be over Zoom. I invite you to come. You can email John Miles and um, register. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for this delay, and thank you. <laughs>